So we're back to part four now of our extreme weather design shelter, shelter in the storm renovation of the horse trailer. My name is Jill and what I'm doing with these videos is I'm doing a sequential process of how to build out a new trailer or an old trailer in that it's prepared for extreme weather. So remember we're talking about things like wind, ice, uh, lightning, rodents, things like that that you might experience on the road. Now today's episode is really focusing on the wiring and the electronics and so there's three goals I have with this video. One is to show you what I have now do kind of a general overview of what the electronic wiring system is for people like me who needed to be reminded and two I'm doing it for someone hi Kevin that will hopefully be helping me do the new trailer and three I want to show you what I want to actually do over there so those are our three main goals we're gonna just take a quick deep breath and get started on the other side All right, so I'm gonna to try to do this as simply as I can in terms of just a general overview and things that you need to consider while you are either planning your existing trailer or RV or if you're starting from scratch. And that's really important because the kind of system that you design will depend on if you're working with an existing pre-wired system or you're starting from scratch. And so I'm sort of operating under the assumption that I'm starting from scratch because I'm pulling everything out We'll see, I don't know if that's 100%. But I wanna start with the old system. So what you are seeing is I plug in directly to an electrical pole. So uh, I'm not gonna explain everything to you because that would take a humongous uh, video, but this is just a way for you to kind of write down terms and educate yourself. If you're gonna live like this, you need to understand the basics of electricity and how your electricity works. So the first thing is you need a power source. So that's either gonna be plugging into something, using your batteries or some kind of solar, wind, other generator, something else that generates the electricity. Then you have to understand your AC alternating current, DC direct current. And from that, you have your watts, your volts, and your amps. As a side note, I think I watched five videos trying to understand watts, volts, and amps. All five of them had to go back and make corrections. I walked away feeling very confused. I still don't remember exactly what it all means. It doesn't matter <laughs> until you need to actually figure out which parts are important for you. And the most important thing is, is if you're gonna be plugging into something, usually your electrical outlets are either gonna be 15, 20, 30, or 50. And the reason that's important is that 15 and 20 usually will have the three prong, 30 has its own version of plugging in and 50 has its version of plugging in. Because my trailer is old, it was designed for 15 amps. This one, I haven't decided 100% yet, but the reason that people use 50 amps is usually those great big RVs are running like two full air conditioners, which take about 1500 watts each. So that's 3000 watts. To give you a frame of reference, my 20 amp plug over there will take at a max between 2200, 2400 watts, at least when I talked to the electrician who put it in. He said that's kind of what it's geared for. So uh, those are just the reasons why you need to know also what you're gonna be running inside. So my rule of thumb is I look at the watts on everything and then I add up how much I use during the day and you wanna add in any kind of surge with that, what's consistent, what needs to run all the time. So whether that's refrigerator or electrical equipment or medical equipment, if that's gonna be something that you need. And then you need to break it down from there in terms of how much power you need to generate, what sources of power you wanna generate from, which means how are you gonna wire it, things like that. So that's like the world's simplest overview. So the power comes from outside somewhere on something, whether it's plugging in solar, uh, solar panels on your roof, a battery that your car is generating when you drive, however it works for you. So the power comes in, then you have to do the inverter converter. And I'm gonna link a video below that I watched as a reminder from Pippi Peterson is, what kind of kicked this off for me is that my converter died. See that insert here. So that's my converter. Can you hear that? 
Newton has officially died after 47 years of service. Bye! Bye! And after 47 years, I think it did really good. But basically what that's doing is it's bringing AC power, alternating current from my electrical pole, converting it so that I can plug things in to my trailer. An inverter does the opposite. It takes the DC and it makes you able to use your AC appliances. And all your AC appliances are going to have that three prong and your DC or 12 volt uh, will have that thing. That if you look on your car dash, you know how you plug in your 12 volt. Used to be cigarette lighter. Do we even say that anymore? Mine always seem to get lost by the time I buy them as used cars. So anyway, so you need to decide how you want to wire your trailer. Um, I have not ever decided to use batteries in that trailer. So for this trailer, my goal is to use primarily electricity externally that I can plug into in addition to having an off-grid system which I want to use uh, as solar and my ideal goal, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do that or not, is to have a portable solar system so that I can bounce it back and forth between this horse trailer and then I want to get a van. So I want to be able to move it back and forth. So I don't know if that's possible or not, but that is my goal. Now the thing that I'm going to be doing in here, which is freaking people out, is I don't want to put my wiring behind my walls inside my insulation. And the reason I don't want to do that, that's part of this extreme weather idea, is number one, I don't want it fried if I do get hit by lightning. Two, the rodents eat everything. It's really difficult to do repairs when your wiring is stuffed in behind your walls. Three, if there's a leak and something shorts out, again, you got to go behind your wall. So while those things don't happen very often, they're extremely complicated in terms of getting them fixed. So that's my personal reasoning. I have been running off of electrical cords and outlets this entire time. It really hasn't bothered me. Uh, my plan is to use that uh, section that I'm showing you here. That I'm not going to put insulation that's permanent in. I'm going to have those as the ability to run wires and cords so they'll either come down and then I'm also going to do the same thing at the bottom. My goal with this trailer is to be as extremely flexible as possible. Once you put in permanent outlets, um, you're restricted to your wiring being there. So I want to have as, uh, I want to be able to create as uh, simple a design as possible that allows me to have the maximum amount of change and adaptation as I go. And I also want to be able to live in here if there was no electricity, whether it's just a wood stove and a candle or a kerosene lamp. So that's my personal goal. Obviously, it won't work for everybody. Uh, the, the other thing that you have to consider in terms of the wiring is your if you're pulling a trailer, which I will be doing, is your trailer has to connect to your lights and to your electrical brakes. So the thing that I'm showing you is you have to have an electrical braking system inside your vehicle that's pulling. That runs to the back of your vehicle. It has either a five, six, or seven prong connector that connects to your trailer. And that has to be synced up with your lights and with your electric brakes. Now, all of my wiring in this horse trailer and that truck has been chewed through or broken. Uh, my white trailer, my tiny trailer, is still all good as far as I know. What I need is my truck, this horse trailer, and the white trailer all to have consistent wiring together so that I can hook the truck up to either one. So that's what I need from my wiring process. And some of the wire looks okay, some of it is in bad shape. So my goal, I think, is just to replace all of it while we're doing it. Now the other thing that I've learned along the way is I don't like my RV or trailer lights. I hardly ever use them. And I think I have seven lights that are wired into that trailer. I use maybe three of them every once in a while. So I've really learned to live without them. And so my goal isn't to have, again, lights wired into the system. My goal is to have uh, what I think I want to do is do battery or USB powered lights. Now this little lamp I'm showing you right now is a USB charged light. It's been awesome when the electricity goes out, which it's done three times this year, is all I have to do is lean back and turn that light on. So it doesn't matter if the power is out. I still have light. No more groping around in the dark like where did I leave my flashlight? Where did I leave my emergency lantern? 
which I've done. And so I really like that. And the other thing that I've really come to like is I string Christmas lights around my perimeter instead of using any kind of overhead light system. So that's going to be my main lighting source. And now they have all these really cool uh, battery or USB powered and some of them are motion sensor lights that are either, you know, you can plug in, you can do by battery, or you can do by USB charging. And I'm going to keep most of my lighting uh, separate because I just happen to like that. It feels like a little bit more control and it's not draining off of any large battery because the big batteries are expensive. So lighting is usually very few watts, which means it doesn't chew up a lot of electricity, but Again, I'm all about trying to make it as simple and as adaptable as possible. Now, the other things that you're going to want to consider is uh, things like heating up water, heating, uh, running a refrigerator, running heating or cooling devices. Those are all the things that are going to take up a lot of electricity. So the more comfort you want, just as a basic rule of thumb, the more comfort that you want, the more control over your environment the more electricity you're going to need. And so the reason why it's important to know that ahead of time is what kind of wires you use in terms of gauges, uh, how much you can draw off of a single source is important. So I think that's it in its most simple and generic form. So if you're still watching this, Kevin, uh, that's kind of where I'm at. I don't want to figure out all my electrical needs. My goal with this particular project is to just get the initial wiring laid for the truck and the two trailers so that I can hook up the brakes and the lights. Uh, again, my, and then what's going to come into the uh, general system there that I saw, showed you on the outside. So uh, I don't have a complete plan because I haven't done the math yet on what, how much power I need to generate. I kind of know what I use now and so, uh, but I'm going to be adding some systems to this trailer so I have to factor that in. So that's kind of where we're at. Yes, we are moving forward. I will be sharing you more of the details in the next video I make. But remember, this is supposed to be open source. So for those of you who want to help other people by supplying really good links, comments, and articles, post those below because my goal with these videos isn't to just be about my project and my process, but as a way to think about yours. And you guys have given me some really good information. So I like that, that we can share that below so anybody can look it up. So that's it for today. I'm going to say thank you. I will be getting back to you with this second part of this one when we actually do the wiring. And the next project after the wiring is to put in the initial floor. So very excited, progress is on the horizon. And with that, we'll see you next time.